Sometimes looking at sacred truths with new perspectives can be exhilarating and exciting, and sometimes it can be downright uncomfortable. I love the parable of the lost son. It's a parable where at various points in our lives or in my life, I've been able to see myself as the father, as the younger son, and as the older son. A central interpretation of our Protestant faith of, of this story emphasizes the Father's gracious love above and above all, above anything else, particularly above the older brother's sense of rules, or even the younger brother's wayward ways. The theological underpinnings here, for those of you that may be interested in that level of detail, is about that battle between faith and faith for faith or faith alone or faith by works. Probably something that only some of us might be interested in, those years-long battle of, of theology. But I ask you, as you've heard this parable before, and I suspect for many of you, you've heard it before, yes? Here in the sanctuary, yeah. How have you felt most connected? Have you found yourself as the lost son? As the father? Maybe your parent is like this one. A father with a never-ending love. Or maybe your parents were ab absolutely not. Maybe you're still feeling that loss and rejection, even all these years later. So much attention on this parable, and I would say for me too, has been really on the youngest son and the dad. But today I want to draw our focus and attention to that older brother. That older brother was raised just like the younger brother. But hey... The difference is he listened, he followed, he followed the steps laid out for him. He didn't question, he put it, his back into all of the work that he did every single day, day in and day out. He showed up, he showed the love that he had for his father by following the family plan. He stuck to it, he stayed with it. Even when his friends were having fun, he was on the farm. He was doing what he was supposed to do. He was there every single day and his brother wasn't. What about that older brother? The parable is left open-ended. Will the older brother be reconciled and join that party? Will the father's efforts at reconciliation prove successful? We don't know. The father's invitation remains open open to join the party of reconciliation. And Jesus leaves that open invitation on the table for each one of us, all of us older sons and older daughters. Jesus leaves that invitation for us to put our party clothes on and to join his party of reconciliation. At the beginning of the chapter of Luke, where this story is situated in this morning's reading, Luke sets this parable and the two before it, the parable of the lost coin and the parable of the lost sheep, directly at the feet of the scribes and the Pharisees. Because those scribes and Pharisees, they were grumbling. <laughs> they were grumbling about everything Jesus was doing. What the heck was he doing eating with those tax, tax collectors, those sinners? Oh, they were grumbling. Those scribes and Pharisees. Don't we like to damn those in this 21st century reading of Scripture? But why don't we, just for a moment this morning, take on those party clothes? So I'm going to ask you to take a wild leap with me right now. And let's imagine that we're all the scribes and the Pharisees in these stories. And to do that, of course, since we're putting ourselves as the scribes and Pharisees, we have to remove all that negativity about them. 
because now it's us, so we're good people, right? We're likable. It means that we're not hypocrites, like we always call the scribes and the Pharisees. It means that we believe we're observant and we're modest and we're enthusiastic about our faith and we love God and we love Jesus and, and you know, we're really interested in Jesus, actually. We couldn't say we love Jesus, but the scribes and the Pharisees, they didn't love Jesus yet. But they love the Torah and they're really interested. So now that we have these Pharisees' clothes on, are you with me? It's an awkward outfit to wear. But let's just keep this, this outfit on for a minute. Imagine we're listening to Jesus. And not only are his parables turning over the truths to which we've subscribed our whole lives, but his actions are too. I mean, he healed on the Sabbath. Nobody did that. It wasn't okay. He was running around with the tax collectors and, and known sinners, the very people that we Pharisees and scribes earnestly believe are unclean. They can't even go into the synagogue. And so we all start to grumble. Because we're the scribes and the Pharisees. We look at each other with those knowing looks. We give each other a rolling eye. We start to figure out what our Facebook post is going to be when we get home. Because we're right there on our phones. Because we got something to say about this and we're putting it out there. This just isn't right. I mean, we're uncomfortable. We're afraid. Because, well, the stuff that Jesus is doing, we've never done it that way before. <laughs> We're uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, our parents told us the stuff that he's doing is the very stuff that will get us in a lot of trouble. It's wrong. With a capital W. Jesus wasn't acting the way we've always been taught to act. He wasn't following the rules. Those very rules that we've been taught, those very rules that help us identify ourselves as righteous, that help us identify ourselves as good people, as upstanding, as faithful, as moral, as clean, and most importantly, as right with God. And in that very moment, the master storyteller uses his craft and points out that the scribes and the Pharisees, us, <laughs> are the older sons in this story of the lost son. They're estranged from their brothers, all those brothers that they call unclean. But in truth, they don't even know what just happened to them. They don't even know what they just heard. Well, because it just can't be so. And you know, we in our scribe and Pharisee outfits sit and ponder, if we're honest, that oftentimes we too can't see that we are in need of reconciliation with our brothers and sisters as well. Phew, that was a big leap. Was that a reading or a perspective you've ever thought of, this parable of the lost son or the prodigal son? Yeah, thank you, right? No. We've always been like, oh, I've been the prodigal. I've been the wayward one. I've been the one that made the mistakes. Oh, I want to be like the father. The brother, he was just jealous. I kind of wrote him off. <laughs> Anyone else? All these years, I have to admit it, I've kind of like not paid a lot of attention to that brother. Thank you, Jesus, for being patient with me. So how do we make sense of this? How do we make sense of this story and perceive and see with new eyes a story that we thought we knew so well and see a reality there that was set before us? It says right at the beginning of that chapter, Jesus was telling the story to the Pharisees and the scribes. Because they were mocking him. They were questioning him. They were judging him for these very things. We sing the songs of our faith, some of us better than others. And I was going to try to sing this for you, but I'm not going to. But you know the song. Blessed be the tie that binds our, our hearts in Christian love. Who can just whip that out here? The tie that binds. Right? All right. We sing it, we believe it, or we listen to other people sing it better than we can. 
But man, it's really hard to live out if we're honest. In Brian McLaren's book, Faith After Doubt, he compares the journey of faith with the journey of life and identifies four stages of spiritual growth. For some of us, the concepts of this book, which we will review over the next six weeks, will provide the words to articulate the journey we've already started. It will provide vision. It will provide encouragement. For some of us, concepts in this book will articulate new concepts and ideas which will make us a little uncomfortable, might even overwhelm us a little bit. So as we dig in, I want you to know something really important, and I'm going to repeat this week after week after week as we dig in here. Each of us are loved just the way we are. There's no right or wrong in the stages of faith. Our journeys of faith are just that, our journeys. I've selected this sermon series, or to to build this sermon series on this book, and I've selected this book and this book study as we strive to grow in our understanding of our faith and the people we meet along our journey. For us to truly be able to be more open, to be more welcoming, and to live up to what I say at the beginning of each service, No matter who you are or where you are, on your journey of faith and life, you're welcome here. We've got to do some work. We have to continually strive to learn more about people, to learn more about how we grow as people, and to learn more about faith. So this book tells the story of an evangelical pastor who grew in his faith after struggling with significant doubt along his journey. Significant doubt. And when I say he was an evangelical pastor, as as we dig into this book, for those of you that are going to join the book study, and I'm going to be posting stuff online, so even if you're not meeting with us on Tuesday nights, you'll have some videos to keep up and get more detail. But he was really like indoctrinated into a very um, um, evangelical way of belief. Very strict ideas about right versus wrong that go well beyond anything preached here. So he was, he was at a place very different than where we're at. But yet, <clears throat> a place where many, maybe many of us have started to. And one of the things I really enjoy about the book and about uh, the way these stories, and he uses lots of stories to share the message, is the way that McLaren normalizes doubt as part of not just his journey, but all of our journeys. Far too many people were raised in faith to believe that doubt is the enemy of faith, that we can't question But McLaren teaches that doubt is necessary, and not only necessary, but incredibly valuable. It's something we need to learn, to live with, and to learn from. There is no shame. There's nothing we need to hide. We need to talk about our doubts as part of our faith and create safe places to do so. We need, and I believe we actually crave, faith communities where we can be open, where we can be ourselves, where we can dialogue and grow together. Our faith communities need to be a safe place for all four stages of faith, as we'll learn about in this book, a safe, supportive environment where people can be guided and held through the journey from faith to doubt and then towards a new kind of faith again. Over the next several weeks, we'll review each one of the stages. Today, we'll focus in on stage one. Stage one is called simplicity. Stage two is called complexity. Stage three is called perplexity. And stage four is called harmony. These stages aren't levels. I don't expect you to memorize all that. I'll be following up. And these stages are not good, nor are they bad. Each stage makes possible what follows, and each stage is necessary, and it's kind of like math. And if you knew me, you knew I have no business. I I have even less business talking about math than I do trying to sing that song. But even I know that you don't really start, you don't learn math by starting with division and multiplication, right? 
you first start with addition and subtraction. And maybe even before that, you just learn how to count. You can't enter the final stages of faith or the final stages or additional stages of math without first starting at the beginning. These four stages of faith are four ways of seeing, four ways of being, and four skill sets at our disposal. Some of us may journey through all of these stages, but we still need the element, element, specific elements from each one of them. Stage one teaches us, us the difference between right and wrong. Stage two encourages us to be curious and flexible. Stage three opens the door to humility and self-knowledge. Stage four is all about harmony. And through it all, doubt keeps us moving, keeps us growing. And although doubt becomes the trigger from which we move, it's actually love which pulls us forward to the next stage of faith. And as McLaren explains in the book, these stages we'll learn about are not just for Christian faith or the Christian faith. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a framework that uh, creates an understanding for all different types of faith. When McLaren is describing faith before doubt, he says faith before doubt is about correct beliefs. I've asked you to share a belief that you have. Faith after doubt is about revolutionary love. Jesus doesn't teach us a list of beliefs to be memorized and recited, although if you went to Sunday school, you might have believed that for a while. Instead, he teaches a way of life that culminates in the call to revolutionary love. So last week, I shared with you some of my upbringing that I was raised in a, in a Catholic way. And I went stumbling, and I'm going to say stumbling, into seminary, not skipping. I was stumbling. I was questioning. I was not confident. I didn't believe I belonged there. I didn't believe I was good enough. I finally entered seminary, I stumble into classes, and I start to hear concepts I have never heard before. It's all I could hear in my head is, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. And I was hearing these concepts and thoughts that I just never even thought possible. And I heard the Lord's Prayer in a whole different way, and I was mad about that. And I remember saying to my seminary professor, wait a minute, tell me. You're taking everything apart here. You're deconstructing it all. I wasn't this confident, but I was inside. <laughs> I was much more timid. But I'll tell you, I said, so what does it even mean to be Christian then? You're taking it apart for me. What does it even mean? And so he turned around and he looked at me and said, Patty, what does it mean to be Christian? And I said, come on. I don't know. <laughs> I was looking for certainty. I came out of a faith tradition with a whole lot of certainty. I was raised in a way where I was told what to believe and how to believe and what was right and what was wrong and that God knew it all. And although I thought by the time I got to seminary I had let go of much of that, I was fooling myself. I did not. And hence started the, and there began the journey of my journey into my growth, my faith growth. And it felt, you know, a little bit like a, a meat grinder. But, you know, in the end, it was really good. <laughs> so what is stage one? Thank you for laughing. No one else thought that was funny. <laughs> so what does stage one faith really look like? It begins with key values of being right, being good, obeying authority, staying faithful to tradition, remaining loyal to the in-group. If there was a bumper sticker that captured stage one faith, it would sound something like this. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. <laughs> God is to be obeyed and certainly not questioned. Everything is black and white, right or wrong. The hallmark of stage one is certainty. Faith is simple to understand with clearly defined rules and expectations that are nicely spelled out for you. And they're right there in the Bible. And you know, the stage when faith has its adv advantages. It's kind of nice to live in a world 
with clear lines of authority and indisputable chain of command with God in charge. It can be comforting to think that if I read the Bible and do what it says, everything in my life will go well. It's certainly appealing to have simple, clear answers for all of our problems today. It can be comfortable. It doesn't sound so bad. Doubt and questions may be the enemy of those in stage one faith, but many people find their comfort right there. And they don't move from stage one faith. But our challenge is we're building community, is we're building unity and diversity, which I talked a lot about last week, is that those very same things that some people enjoy and find comfort in stage one are the very things that other people in other stages find very uncomfortable. Those people who do doubt, who question, whose lives take them in a very different direction. McLaren puts it this way. He says, faith is a matter of head, heart, and gut, of meaning, belonging, and survival of intellect, intuition, and instinct. It's a whole brain, whole self-proposal. So I have a car. um, Well, I have a car. That's, a, that's exciting. But <laughs> on my car, I got some bumper stickers. I've been having the, I, or some stickers, and I, um, I, they've been driving around in the inside of my car for several months now. And finally, after Christmas, I put them on the back. And I have one that is, well, it's like a math equation. And it says, uh, you know, G is greater than your ups and your downs. You know, God is greater than your ups and your downs. And then I have a really pretty cross. And then I very intentionally have a rainbow sticker that says, love wins. And I say I very intentionally do that because I very intentionally realize that if I have too much God stuff on the back of my car, I say God stuff wouldn't just. But I felt like if I have all the the cross and I don't put where I stand, that I am an inclusive pastor that sees all people that openly loves and accepts people of all different genders and sexualities, transgender, that if I didn't say that, that by the very mere fact that I only had the cross, that I might accidentally leave someone out. That's who I am. It's important to me. And for many of us, we let those types of things guide us, right? The belonging. Or maybe our fear. For me, myself, I say that I I don't, you know, I'm not even going to say what stage I think I'm in. I'm still thinking, I'm still figuring that out. But I had some fear of feeling that someone would think I was excluding them. I wanted to ensure that my, my expression of faith demonstrates my love for all. Really important. I couldn't let that go. And, but sometimes we let our fear, our need of belonging, lead us almost to the extent or, ex- excuse me, expense of our intellect or, or our reason. And the whole process can feel us, leave us feeling kind of torn between different loyalties, affections, and relationships. So I, I was going to try to try to build this, this, this joke right now and say, so a stage one and a stage four Christian walk into a bar. And then I thought, would they walk into a bar? Jeez, I don't know. I'll let you ponder that. And if you can finish the joke for me for next week, you get a bonus point. My question is, can unity and diversity be achieved when at the very beginning of our faith, existence, understanding, and development, we believe in this idea of right or wrong, black versus versus white approach to faith? Is it fair to ask a stage one Christian to accept and be open to stage two, three, and four Christians? The people that have gone through a period of doubt and likely deconstructed the very things that a stage one person's foundation is built upon. How do we hold it all together? How do we bring it all forward when we have at times such competing views? To me, I believe this is exactly what Jesus' ministry is all about. He came proclaiming good news for those sons and daughters, usually considered to be the outsiders, the poor, the captive, the blind, the oppressed. Who's coming to the party? 
I want to bring us back to that party, the parable that ended with the open invitation for all of us. Should the elder son ever accept the invitation to join the party, the father's love will have reconciled estranged sons. The parable ends with the hope that that will actually eventually happen. I believe that grace is the invitation to follow as a disciple of Christ in the work of reconciliation, of peacemaking. The challenge in this parable facing the obedient sons and daughters to follow Jesus' differing way of obedience, that's our challenge too. How do we come to the table and truly, not just quietly, nicely sit next to each other, but truly accept our brothers and sisters with a differing way towards obedience, a differing way to faith, one that might make us very uncomfortable, Who's to say who's right? A differing, way, a differing way. And that, my friends, is the journey we are now embarking on over these next six weeks. As we uncover each other's differing ways of obedience. And we celebrate our unity and diversity. May it be so. Amen.